advisor to the president of the Corps of Repu Republic of Guyana. He's also an advocate for Guyana's interest in oil and gas. He's the former advisor, as I said, and he's had a career with a major oil company working wor worldwide and has a doctorate in offshore engineering from the University of Oxford. Please welcome Dr. Yan Mangal. So forward is Nigel. And back. Yep, great. Thank you, Nigel. And there's a pointer. Great. So the perspective I'll be coming from is quite different than uh, most of you. And uh, I try to target this presentation recognizing that uh, difference in uh, perspective. So I'll start with the opportunity for Guyana. And this is uh, the first section of the proposal for the new Department of Energy, which was created in Guyana. And I drafted that proposal in 2018. So there's an opportunity here to transform Guyana, to radically transform Guyana. And I highlight some of the applicable sentences. Guyana has an opportunity to achieve rapidly many dreams which remain unfulfilled even after 50 years, and that's uh, 50 years since independence. For Guyana to be transformed and for Guyana to benefit from this resource, leaders must dare to think nationally, apolitically, long term, and even 50 years ahead. And you may think that might be quite difficult from the leadership you've seen in Guyana for the last 50 years, but that's what's needed. Guyana only has one opportunity to get this right, and that opportunity is now. We need to get it right at the start. We may have to go a little bit slower now so as to increase the rewards over the long term, but right now we cannot afford haste, which may cause expensive mistakes. So that's the, I believe, the country's perspective, the government's perspective. Now, as businesses interested in oil and gas, your objectives include growing your businesses, making profits, and that's perfectly legitimate. You know, it wouldn't exist if uh, people weren't willing to take the risk. But actually, there's a bigger, more important and more difficult opportunity as well, and that's the transformation of Guyana positively. It's actually a much more difficult task than the task you guys are involved in. So the opportunity for Guyana is to look at what has happened in the past for similar situations, and it's, it's not a good picture. You know, Countries like Anna rarely make a success of their huge natural resource endowment. Hence, our challenge with Guyana is to prove to a world, a skeptical world, that in Guyana we can exploit our resources in an equitable and sustainable way. And that is the challenge and the opportunity for Guyana. And to do that, we need to focus on two main components. Firstly, we need to maximize the revenue. And then secondly, we need to not squander that revenue. For most of you in the room, you will become wealthy as business people and do extremely well, irrespective of how Guyana does. Because there's a lot of oil to develop, and that oil will be developed. And you as business people will do well, locally and internationally. The challenge is for the country. So in terms of maximizing the revenue, let's look at the first project in the Stabrook block. This is purely for illustration purposes, 
This is LISA phase one, and this data is from 2017 with the current fiscal terms. So actually, it, uh, it's assuming about 100,000 uh, barrels per day. Now it's probably up to about 120. It's assuming the 4.4 billion capex cost. That dropped to about 3.7. But anyway, let's use this for illustrative purposes. So initially, the company makes a huge investment here that's shown here as 4.4, but it's actually 3.7 now billion. There's a cost recovery period initially, starting in about 2020, once oil starts flowing. When that ends, then the wedge to the government appears. And that's when the revenue to the government really starts. In this period of cost recovery, the country may see about 300 million uh, dollars per year, which is significant to a country with a GDP of 3.6 billion. At this point, after the bulk of cost recovery, that wedge will appear and the revenue to the country will be just less than a billion dollars per year. And that'll be in about 2026. Now, it isn't just one project. These are numerous projects stacked on top of each other. So let's look at the next slide. So what I've done here, I've just stacked three LISA 1s on top of each other. Now, we know that's not correct because LISA 2 is a bit bigger than LISA 1, and we know Pyara will be different. But anyway, some takeaways here are that because of the lack of ring fencing between these projects in one block, that wedge, the start of that wedge gets shifted into the future because future projects get cost recovered from current projects or subsequent projects get cost recovered. But anyway, during the cost recovery period, the income to the country will be between, could be up to 800 million a year, which again is very significant. If there were three projects and there were no subsequent projects after this point here, then when that wedge appears, the revenue to Guyana is probably a, a bit, a low number would be about 2.5 billion a year because my numbers here are conservative. This is for about 300,000 barrels per day. If the production is up to 500,000 barrels per day, that revenue to the country will be about 4 billion per year. Now we have to remember the GDP is 3.6. So these are huge, huge numbers and huge issues to deal with. So still on the revenue and maximizing the revenue, let's look at the contract for the Starbrook block under the current terms, which results in that revenue. So this is a, a study done by Open Oil, which is an independent outfit in Germany that compares these fiscal regimes. And the reason I like Open Oil and firms like it is because they're independent. They don't get most of their revenue by doing work for Exxon or Chevron. So they're not suffering from a potential bias. So the, here's a comparison between countries similar to Guyana. And you can see the overall take for Guyana, even though it's huge and substantial for the country, is still low by international benchmark standards. So the overall take for the LISA 1 project over 20 years is about 52%. While it's comparable countries in Africa and other areas range from 16 above. So there's an opportunity here for Guyana. So what is that opportunity? So the word renegotiation is a bad word, or we're told it's a bad word. And uh, that's understandable. I was on the oil company side of the fence. However, when you look at history, when you look at the data, 
These contracts are regularly renegotiated. And there are reasons for that, very good reasons. A renegotiation is not a tearing up of a contract, it's a rebalancing. The longer an unfair and unbalanced deal lasts, the greater the potential backlash. Just look at Venezuela next door. Chavez was not created out of thin air. There was a reason why Chavez came to power. We don't want that in Guyana. So here's a paper, one paper, and I refer to numerous papers. This is by George Cahal at a uh, forum in Oxford. Bad deals spell trouble. The worse the deal, or the more imbalanced the deal, the more likely it is to be renegotiated. Don't believe everything you read in the papers. Most of the renegotiations or industry transformations have ended in success. Terms such as resource nationalization are an oversimplification of what has been happening on the ground. Two other reports. The one on the left is from Sierra Leone, sorry, Liberia with President Shreeli. When she came into power, she recognized that there were some serious issues with their, all of their natural resource contracts. And they actually spent a number of years amicably renegotiating all of their natural resource contracts, mainly around iron ore. On the right, it's, there's a center at Columbia University, and they do a lot of work on renegotiations. They actually developed a mechanism that companies and countries can follow to do these renegotiations. Now, here's an example of a potential renegotiation in Guyana. I'm just using LISA 1, but if we, here we have the current terms, the current contract, 2% royalty, zero tax, on the right, a possible future contract. I just picked these numbers. Uh, say 10% royalty, 25% tax. And then on the row, the first is the company's share from LISA 1. On the second row, it's the government's share. And with those changes in terms, we would see a shift of about 2.6 billion. This is over the 20 years of LISA 1. That 2.6 billion would shift from company to government. And that would take the government's take up from 52% to 68%. That's just purely an example. There's no basis for those numbers. But there, this is just one project. Guyana has five projects or more stacked up. So if this first project, which is relatively small compared to the subsequent projects, is 2.6 billion, then after about three or four projects, you know, Guyana could be forfeiting over $10 billion. Or that's, from the country's perspective, that's the opportunity there. So on maximizing the revenue and on the subject of renegotiations, renegotiations are not about penalizing all companies. If you look at all the successful renegotiations, it's not about penalizing all companies. Those who renegotiate recognize risk. They recognize the profitability. They do detailed analysis to understand the company's economics. It's not about going in there and bashing people. Unfortunately, Guyana doesn't really understand the economics, and Guyana needs to do a lot of work understanding the company's economics and its own economics. All companies take risks with their huge investments, and they need to be rewarded when there is success, like in Guyana. Some possible win-win strategies for the Stabrook block. First of all, understand what's going on, run the economics. Secondly, an option could be to maintain existing terms for the first project, say LISA 1, so the company is rewarded for the risk. And that reward, you know, might be 2.6 billion based on the economics you run. It could be more, could be less. And then try to negotiate for better terms in subsequent projects. 
And the reason for the project by project basis is because the Starbrook block is so huge, all of Guyana's oil could end up being in the Starbrook block. So it would have to be looked at on a project by project basis. So all the previous slides were around maximizing the resource. But the second component for success for Guyana is not squandering the oil revenue, whether it's 300 million per year or 4 billion per year. The risk is still there. So right now, is, can Guyana be relied upon to use its revenue effectively, whatever that revenue is? And probably the answer is no. Guyana is preparing, but right now that answer is probably no. Guyana has to do a lot. The government of Guyana has always had low absorptive capacity, which means it struggles to spend money effectively for the benefit of its people. And that's because of institutional capacity, lack of institutional capacity, lack of process. For decades, many large state capital projects have suffered mismanagement and corruption, and we need to change that. Because how else are we going to spend $4 billion a year or whatever part of it gets pumped into the economy? If there is practically zero long-term strategic planning in Guyana. Uh, Guyanese, because of the politics, have been very short-termist in their you know, the political leaders in their uh, views. So we need strategic planning, very strong strategic planning to come to the fore. That's essential and it's a critical gap and it may even be being filled right, right now, but that's a critical gap. Also to spend that revenue and not squander it, the government has to think outside the box. The government will not be able to spend this money on its own. The government will not be able to disperse this revenue so we could look at solutions like well-regulated lending entities or banks to, say, give a particular bank, set up a bank that's responsible for infrastructure and give them 100 million US. A different bank, you're responsible for hospitals or education and use the private sector and use, uh, the analogy I make is, you know, like the IDB, the World Bank, that's what they do. They go around and spend money on these projects, and they have very good procurement procedures, robust procurement procedures. So Guyana can look at a similar model. The government will not be able to do it itself. So I actually see the squandering of the oil revenue as a more of a challenge than the maximizing of the resource and uh, the renegotiation. But the squandering of the revenue is not an area that has had much uh, visibility. That's it. Thank you.